It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now we know with the smells that are going to be filtering up from downstairs that it's going to be hard to concentrate this morning. But there's going to be plenty of food. It's not even ready yet. So I know that about 10 after 11, everybody's going to start looking at their watches. But you know, I just encourage you today to honestly just turn this time over to the Lord and uh, give, give him your full attention. And through the week, we, we're pulled into all these different directions to do so many different things. But we're here, and let's just be able to give him all of ourselves, our minds. I know it's hard with our thoughts because we want to kind of think about things, think about what we need to do later this week because the devil wants to get you thinking about things other than Jesus. So let's pray, and then we're going to turn the service over to the Lord. Amen. Father God, we love you, and we praise you, and we give you glory. We give you honor. We thank you for this privilege to be able to come into this house, to be able to worship you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here to have your way in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You laid down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be saved. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And worthy is the King who conquered the grave. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And worthy is the King who conquered the grave. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And worthy is the King who conquered the grave. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me This is amazing grace this is unfailing love 
that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you lay down in your life that I would be set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me amen There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare your living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen how the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord your presence Lord There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare your living hope, your presence, Lord. I tasted and seen. Are the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is heard done and your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome in your presence Lord your presence Lord Your presence, Lord. Your words are like fire burning in my soul. Burn out the dross. Bring forth the gold. Yes, 
Let the fire of the Holy Ghost burn in me. Burn in me. Burn in me. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost burn in me. You feel like fire. You feel like fire Shut up in my bones Consume me, Lord Make me your own Burn in me Burn in me Yes, let the fire of the Holy Ghost burning me burning me burning me let the fire of the Holy Ghost burning me you feel like fire you feel like fire shut up in my bones consume me though make me your own burn in me burn in me yes let the fire of the Holy Ghost let it burn in me burn in me burn in me let the fire of the Holy Ghost let it burn in me Yes, let the fire of the Holy Ghost let it burn in me. We're going to pull down the altars. We're going to tear down the walls. We're going to raise up the banner of righteousness and declare that Jesus is Lord of all. Let's go up. Going up to the high place is going up to the high place is going up to the high place is gonna tear the devil's kingdom down. We've been deceived, we've been deceived by the devil too long. We're gonna tear the devil's kingdom down. We're gonna reclaim everything. Everything the devil stole, we're gonna tear the devil's kingdom down, down, down. Let's go up, going up to the high place. It's going up to the high place. It's going up to the high place. It's gonna tear the devil's kingdom down. We've got to be strong, yes, we've got to be bold. We're gonna tear the devil's kingdom down. We're gonna reclaim everything the devil stole. We're gonna tear the devil's kingdom down, down, down. Let's go up, going up to the high places, going up to the high places, going up. To the high place is gonna tear the devil's kingdom down. We're gonna pull down the altars. We're gonna tear down the walls. We're gonna raise up the banner of righteousness and declare that Jesus is Lord of all. Let's go up, going up to the high place is going up. To the high place is going up. To the high place is tear the devil's kingdom down. One more time. We're gonna pull down the altars. We're gonna tear down the walls. We're gonna raise up 
the banner of righteousness and declare that Jesus is Lord all of all. Let's go up, going up to the high places, going up to the high places, going up to the high places, gonna tear the devil's kingdom down. We're gonna tear the devil's kingdom down. We're gonna tear the devil's kingdom down. So Holy Father, we worship you, precious Jesus, our Savior, Holy Spirit. We wait on you, yes, Holy Spirit. We wait on you, Holy Spirit. We wait on you for fire, for fire. glory all power to you all honor and all glory all power to you one more time sing all honor all honor all glory, all power to you, Holy Father, Holy Father, we worship you, precious Jesus, our Savior, Holy Spirit, we wait on Holy Spirit, we wait on you. Holy Spirit, we wait on you for fire, for fire, for fire. your fire, all honor, all glory, all power to you.
rely on more than you, those things that we look to as our salvation that may not be you. God, we know ultimately that this world and that our lives are in your capable hands. We trust you, God. Today, we stand against those things, those things that are not of you in this world. This pandemic is not of you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we curse that COVID-19 and any variation of it. In the mighty name of Jesus, we speak life to those who are fighting for their lives, those who are struggling in Jesus' name. as believers in Jesus Christ. May we be transformed, Lord, by the power of your Spirit in this place today. Meet the needs that are represented here today, Lord, I pray. Because you are a gracious God. You are a God that is over all and in all. And I thank you, Lord, for knowing our needs even before we speak. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, everybody gave a great shout of amen. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated this morning. We're glad that uh, you're here at Eagle Mountain Assembly of God. For those joining us by Facebook, thank you for, uh, for joining us today. Praying for teachers and students as you head back to school. that I wanted to mention. Um, as Tara said today, lunch is going to be uh, provided today for each and every one of you. This is the third Sunday historically in the past. We've uh, done kind of a uh, uh, potluck to where you bring food in and everybody uh, has a chance to show off their culinary skills. Well, with uh, COVID and just safety concerns, and so everybody 
women's ministry has, uh, for years, they have um, put their hearts into action with Compassion International and sponsoring a child. They've had two or three or four different children over the years that uh, I've been here, and uh, they have a, a, a new Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Hope of the nations, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, and fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender, yes I surrender, oh, Savior, He can move the mountains, my God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. 
Oh, Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Yes, he is mighty to save. Amen. Good to be worshiping in the house of the Lord today. Glad you chose, chose to join us. And uh, I just want to put in a little plug for that homemade ice cream. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time, and the Lord led me there, and I was able to sample that ice cream, and it is good. So have no fear. You should uh, uh, be fully blessed by partaking in that. We've, we've got lots of good food down there. You know, we, we got kind of sideswiped back in June when we had our first meal like this, and I think we had like record attendance for the year that Sunday, and all the food got demolished. So we say it's not going to happen this time around. So we need you, okay, to come down there and help us, and we are not going to run out of food. There is going to be plenty, uh, and we hope that you'll uh, be a part of that. Uh, at this time, we will dismiss any preschoolers that haven't already exited. Uh, Tara, you're, Tara's ready to go back there, but uh, don't have any this morning. Okay. So, all right. Well, it is a, a privilege to preach the Word of God, and uh, we have been looking at Psalm 16. And I've told you the last couple weeks as uh, we've been looking at this that this is one of my personal favorites uh, we've all got those, don't we? Places in Scripture where it's like when your life gets troubled, what do you do? Psalm 23 is frequently where people go. Uh, you know, there, Psalm 103 is another one of my favorite. I love uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount uh, when, when life gets uh, tough. But we've got these places, and Psalm 16 is, is one of my places. And over the last two weeks, I've broke down the whole psalm into about seven statements. Statements that we make to ourselves, because all of us talk to, each, to ourselves, don't we? You're talking to yourself right now. Yeah, we talk to ourselves. What do we say to ourselves? What we say to ourselves is very important. And if we say what God says, we're in a good place. How many of you believe that? If we say what God says, we are in a good place. But sometimes we let things, life, uh, get us consumed and excited and upset, and then we start talking <laughs> negative stuff, right? We've all been there and done that. And so I've been talking about how words have power and that uh, when we speak God's truth to ourselves as well as when we speak God's truth to other people, good things happen. God's Word works. The Word of God is quick and powerful, right? The Bible says and so that means, quick means not that it's fast, but that it's alive. The Word of God is living and active, as NIV puts it. And so when we say what God says, there's, there's good stuff that's released in our minds, our, our spirits, our souls. And uh, I have found that I have to really work at watching my mouth. Not just the mouth you hear, but the mouth that, that's always talking up here. Because it's just real easy to get negative and critical. And right now, I think this is a, a very challenging time. Because when we look at uh, what's going on across our nation and around our world, it can really begin to get us very upset. And so uh, the first statement in uh, the first I will of Psalm 16, I'm not going to emphasize all of them, but I just want to go back to the first one where David says, Psalm 16, verse 1, Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. 
And the I will statement out of that is, I will not be afraid. How many of you believe that that's what God wants for us? We should not be afraid. And David goes on to explain why. For I take refuge in you. Now, if you're taking refuge in God, you should be able to boldly say, I will not be afraid. I don't care what our president does or doesn't do. I don't care what Mr. Fauci has to say. Uh, You know, I'm not not worried about what the governor has to say. I'm not worried about what's, I'm just not going to be afraid. I'm just not going to live in fear. I am going to take refuge in the Lord, your God. And so if you are struggling with anxiety and fear, let me just remind you again, the Lord is a strong and mighty tower, right? That's what the Bible says. The righteous run to it and are what? Saved, right? So we have a strong and mighty tower. If we take refuge in God, we won't walk in fear. And I just want to encourage you in that, you out there on Facebook, to be reminded that this is one of the great heritages of being a Christian is you don't do life alone. You are never alone. You are never out of God's loving care. Believe it or not, and Jesus said it, so we have to believe it, the very hairs of our heads are numbered. Now, some of you, it's an easy task for the Lord. For some of us, it's getting easier for the Lord. But to to think that, that God knows us so well that, that he's just that close. So I will not be afraid because I put my refuge, my confidence in God. So that first truth is very important. If you'd like to hear uh, the five that came after that, you can go back and watch that on uh, Facebook or YouTube And I would encourage you, if you missed that, to go back and do that. I really believe that not because I have preached it, it's the Word of God, and the Word of God works. And I would encourage you to go back and and give that a listen. Today, I'm going to pick up on the last one. This this message didn't start out to be three parts, but it is. And so today, we're going to take a look at the seventh I will. And it comes out of uh, verses 9, 10, and 11, the last three verses in this psalm, and uh, it is this, I will meditate on my happily ever after. I will meditate on my happily ever after. Now, you might be saying, now, Pastor, wait a minute. Is happily ever after really in the Bible somewhere? Well, no. It's not. You're not going to find it. That's, 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 storybook, uh, nursery rhyme stuff, right? Uh, you know, he finds the goose that lays the golden egg and whatever, and they live happily ever after. You know, we, we, we just kind of like, that's just like the primo ending of any story, right? And they lived happily ever after. And, you know, we, we know that that's um, uh, so much a part of what people dream of today. And they'll, they'll say, you know, well, I know that once I get married, I'm going to live happily ever after. And all the married folks say, you are going to have troubles, my friend. The Bible says those who get married are going to have troubles. It's the way it is. Say, well, when I have that baby, we're going to live happily ever after. All the parents and grandparents go, "Mm, they're going to hurt your heart and it's going to be tough. There's no happily ever after. Well, when I get that dream job, yeah, happily ever after. No, no, that doesn't work either, does it? Say, well, when I retire, yeah, Wally Wax, he's living the sweet life. When I get to that, yeah, that's, then, then life's going to really get good. And all the retired folks said, no, it's not a happily ever after thing. There's challenges at every stage. Well, when I, when I get that financial goal met, then I'm going to retire. If I beat cancer, my life is going to be wonderful, happily ever after. This life never gives us a happily ever after. Say, what, you know, I paid to come in and hear this today? <laughs> Well, first of all, you didn't pay unless Wally's doing stuff at the door that I'm not aware of, okay? But uh, I think it's a reality check that we need to have because there is this question, does anybody ever really get a happily ever after? And the Bible answer is yes. 
And I want to unpack that today. Uh, you know, the testimony of David, David's the one who wrote Psalm 16. And, you know, he's called the man after God's own heart. And if you know anything about David, David made some bad mistakes. How would you like to have the worst chapters of your life written in the Bible? Wow. <laughs> That's David. It's just right there. I mean, you know, murderer, adulterer, uh, terrible father. I mean, just all this stuff uh, about David. And yet, God says the last words in the Bible about him, he's a man after my own heart. And you know, the reason for that is because David was a good repenter. Aren't you glad that God gives us second, third, fourth, 27th chances? God's mercies and compassion are new every morning. So we think David wrote this probably a little bit later in his life, as we, we talked about before. And so uh, David gets pretty excited in this psalm. Uh, and let's just pick it up here at the end of it. You know, he's talked about a lot of good stuff, and I won't rehearse that, even though it's really tempting to, because I love the psalm. But here's David winding this down. In conclusion, he says, Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. And we're going to really focus on verse 11. You made known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. David is happy. I mean, he understands that God is not going to abandon him. He's not, he's not looking at the grave as the end. He says, you've made known to me the path of life. It is not a path to death. But if you ask the average person on the street out there, it, it, we, we talk about life being from cradle to grave. Right? Right? That's what it is, cradle to grave. That's, that's the path. That's the way it goes. And David's like, eh, I know better. It's not cradle to grave. What does David say? It, it's from eternity. Remember uh, Psalm 139, right? He said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. God put me together in his workshop. It's, it's from heaven to heaven. How does that sound? Come on now, church, you got to help me preach here. I know I'm preaching over spaghetti and all that. You guys got to help me. It, it is from eternity to eternity. That's the path of life for those who will believe in God. The path begins in the presence of God, and it ends in the presence of God. And David says, I thank God that I have that revelation that this life isn't all of it. You're not going to abandon me to the grave the grave isn't the end. He's, he's excited about the, the, the life that looms large afterwards. You have made known to me the path of life, eternal pleasures at God's right hand. That makes me much more peaceful. Knowing that when this life winds down, that casket, that's not going to be me. Because you know where I'm going to be? I'm going to be e enjoying eternal pleasures at God's right hand. That's where the path of life takes us. To, to know that in the moment when it seems like everything's lost, the prayers for healing have gone unanswered, the prayers of deliverance, the prayers of mercy and grace, all those things, and the time comes for this life to go dark. That in that moment when it looks like the devil won, he's lost. Because we go directly to be in the presence of the Lord. That death that we think is the thing we want to know. That is the very porthole that takes us into eternal pleasures at the Lord's right hand. That's why the Hebrews says, 
that Jesus delivered us from the fear of death that's held us captive all of our lives. We know the path of life. Ha, 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 devil. You don't win. Somebody needs to say, man, I'm going to break my arm here. Right? We, we need, we need to, to talk this up that there is a victorious happily ever after for every single person that loves and serves Jesus. As our bodies wind down in this life, guess what? We're just one day closer to the next. Amen. One day closer to the next. We win. David says, I've been shown the path of life. I know where it all goes. We go from from the darkness of this world into glorious light. And what a day that will be. You know, our hope is built on Jesus Christ. And I, if Jesus doesn't come back first, Marianne, put it on my tombstone. The best is yet to be. I have believed that all my life that I have served Jesus. I mean, I've had a lot of good stuff in this life. I've had a blessed life. But it pales in comparison to what awaits. The best is yet to be. I mean, Paul says, eye has not seen nor ear has heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. That's us. That's why you're here today. You're not here for the spaghetti. You're here for Jesus. All right, that's the right answer. Isaiah, I'm not sure, but... uh, I mean, we've got it made. The best is yet to be. We're going to live forever in the presence of the Lord. And you know, this, this, this reminds us that no matter how ugly this life gets, no matter how hard it gets, nothing can steal our victory. Paul said in Romans 8, He said, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, and I left a few of them out, shall ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. You will always be surrounded by the love of God. God's love runs mightily through us. We need this hope in our soul Can I just tell you bluntly that everything is a problem for you right now will one day not even be a memory? Can you remember your problems from first grade? I can't. Now some of you say, yeah, there was this guy. Okay. But imagine every problem erased and you can't even recall it. Every problem today, every health problem, every financial concern, every relationship, just gone. Changed in, the mo- in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. You know, I get happy preaching this every time, and I miss this. We, we used to be able to go to the, the, the nursing home out there, the Tuscola Health Care Center. And every time I was there, I would preach some variety of this message. Not going to be any of those amber bottles that you see with the white caps. Not going to be any walkers, not going to be any oxygen tanks, not going to be any glasses or hearing aids or canes. When we get to that place where life really begins, it's going to be wonderful. Don't lose your hope in that. That's the the best part of living with God is that it goes beyond this life. That's where the path of life takes us. And if you're following Jesus, you are on the path of life. It's the best news you will hear in your entire lives. But it's only true if you're a Christian. Okay, let's, let's not candy coat this. This is only true for those who follow the one who is the way and the truth and the life so for not not for everybody is this a good news but it is good news for us you know we know the path of life but for those who are without jesus we describe them as being lost right that's 
and say, well, well, I've got this son-in-law and he's lost, but, you know, we're praying for him. You say, lost? Well, you know, maybe, maybe we can't. does he not have GPS? I mean, you know, what's it, what's it going to take? Where is he, right? No, no, he's spiritually lost. Those of us on the path of life understand that terminology, right? That there are people out there that are spiritually lost. They're good people. They mow their grass. They wash their car. They pay their bills. They do their job. They love their mama. But they don't know Jesus. And they are what? They are lost. They're lost. They're they're not on the path of life. They are wandering around looking for a signal. It's like, I I don't know. What what do I do? Where's the path? They don't have a compass. Right? We have the word of truth as believers. We know we're on the path and we know when we get off it, don't we? Come on now, somebody say amen. Right? We got that Holy Spirit going, uh, 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 uh. Back over here. Thank God we've got that compass. But the world doesn't know that. They're lost. They're, they're just living as best they can what was modeled for them by parents or grandparents or the reasonings of their own mind. You know, Jesus talked about this in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 7 and 13, he said that there is a broad path that many take, and it leads to destruction. Why is it a broad path? Well, it's a broad path because it carries a lot of streams. Many people, because they are lost, they follow the traditions and the wisdom of men. Did you know not all religion takes you to heaven? In fact, most of religion doesn't take you to heaven. But there's many people who are very religious in one way or another, following the traditions and the wisdom of men. They're on a broad path because they don't know the author of life. On this broad path, there are, there are uh, Marxists, there's socialism, there's Hinduism, there's Buddhism, there's Islam, there's hedonism. This is a, this is a big path in America, the love of pleasure, right? What do you live for? I live to have a great day. I live to do what I want to do. Well, you're on the broad path, my friend, and you're in a bad place. There's the the God of of paganism, of of materialism. There's the God of legalism out there that's dragging people down the wrong path. There's atheism, and then there's the one in America that is so, so strong. Goodism. I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Why is that, friend? Because I'm a good person. Well, if your mama's the judge, you might be in luck. But probably she's not going to be. And you're going to answer to a holy God. And good is never, ever good enough. You know, Jesus says there's a broad path that leads to destruction, but there's a narrow path that leads to life. That's the path of life. That's what we understand, right, church? We're following Jesus down a narrow path. And broad is the path that leads to destruction. So can I just take a couple minutes here? I don't have Tony to help me out with time, but uh, I am conscious of what's going on in the kitchen, so I will not keep you too long. (laughs) I can always count on Anne. But but let's talk just for a moment about what happens to those on the broad path who reject in this life their creator, the Son of God, uh, Jesus Christ. What What happens to them? Because they are on a path. Just as we're on a path to life, they're on a path to death. You know, it's not a topic that we really like to talk about. But you know, Jesus talked about it all the time. Didn't he? Jesus talked about the consequences of of not serving God in this life. He talked about hell. He talked about a lake of fire. He talked about uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth, you know, and and he said, well, Jesus was supposed to be a happy guy. Well, Jesus loved people. Jesus told people the truth. You know, this earthly life for the lost unbeliever who doesn't know God's love and salvation, this is the closest to heaven they will ever be. Let me say that again. So if, you're, if a lost person is lost, this life is as close to heaven as they will ever get. And you're like, well, wait a minute, this life, it, it, it's, it's kind of harsh. I mean, isn't, 
what do you mean about that? How can, how can this be as close to heaven as you get? Well, because every morning you're still going to see the sunrise, just like God set it in order. The food is going to taste good unless you eat cauliflower. You're going to have air to breathe. You're going to see colors. You're going to feel love. You're going to know happiness. You might have the privilege of being a parent and seeing a child grow, which is a God thing. Right? You're, you're going to know what it's like to uh, grow and develop your body because God designed it this way. Is going to heal and fight off infections, and, and that's the grace of God. And so these are all evidences of God. These are all things uh, that God wants us to enjoy, the sounds and the light, the love and the friendship. And most importantly, if you want him, God is this close to the lost person. That close. He is constantly wooing and drawing and speaking to a lost person so that they might somehow hear something or see something that would make them stop and acknowledge that maybe this world didn't just happen Maybe it didn't just evolve. Maybe there is a creator. And God's like, yes. I'm sending you love letters with every sunrise. I'm I'm blessing you with every sea breeze that you experience. God's like, this is me. You know, Romans 2 says God's kindness, what? It leads us to repentance. God is loving lost people today. Do you believe that? God is loving lost people, and he's wooing them because he wants them to see that he is there. He's wanting them to acknowledge. He's praying, if God could pray, he's he's wooing them to draw them to a place where they would turn and serve him and love him back. You know, if if you, you miss a turn on your GPS, do you think GPSs ever get frustrated you know, it's like, you missed that turn. You missed the next one. What does the GPS say? It's rerouting, redirecting, right? You know, I think God's doing like that. Every, every time we blow through a, a, a stop sign, God's redirecting, 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 redirecting. He's, he's redirecting that lost person to, to intersect somewhere, somehow, God's truth. He's designing life so that it's hard for the lost person to miss God. But he still respects people's free will to choose. But God is working on them and drawing them into his love and light until the very last moment on earth, that lost person still has a chance to say yes the saving faith in Jesus Christ. And God is speaking and drawing that person. But when death comes, the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. And then there comes the judgment. What happens next? Well, we've got 2 Thessalonians to give us a little guidance. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says he, God, will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Now again, we're talking about people who don't find the path of life, people who don't serve Jesus. There's a path. It's a broad path, but it's a path, Jesus said, that leads to destruction. So what's going to happen next? First of all, they're punished with everlasting destruction. You know, I think that there's a lot of people out there that just believe that when you die, it just... It's just over. You cease to exist. But that's not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible tells us that every person lives forever, that we're made in God's image and likeness, that every poor person is an immortal being, somebody who is literally going to live forever. And so annihilation is a myth. You know, nobody ever ceases to exist. 
And for those who persist in telling God no, the end comes and they experience what the Bible calls the second death or a very real place called hell. And you say, you know, Pastor, nobody preaches about hell anymore. Nobody, I mean, that's, 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 like, that's like old stuff. You know, people don't want to be scared like that. What kind of a shepherd could I be if I didn't tell you the truth? about what happens next. It's not something I get excited preaching about, I'll tell you that, but it is a reality that I think we as Christians need to be reminded of. There is a place of everlasting destruction that the Bible calls hell. Secondly, the Bible says that they will be shut out from the presence of the Lord. And I believe this is the very worst part of spending eternity away from God, is that you are shut out from everything that God is. 1 John 1.15 says God is light. Jesus is light. He's the light of the world in John 8.32. How is hell described? Jesus calls it a place of outer darkness. Someday I'm going to preach a whole sermon on light because it's fascinating to me. Did, did you know that, that there's really nothing possesses any color? I said, well, of course, I mean, Corey's shirt's white, and, and Isaiah's bibs are blue, and, and Michelle's top there is red and black. Of course there's color. What do you mean there's no color? No. All we are seeing is how these fabrics reflect light. So what happens when there's no light? There's no color. There's nothing. Everything goes completely dark. And that's why when, you know, we know God is light, Jesus is the light of the world, that when Jesus talked about hell, he said it's a place of outer darkness. That means there is no light. A darkness that is beyond anything we have ever experienced. And that is the, the awfulness of this place of destruction. It is a place where all that is God, uh, you're shut out from that. It's, it's awful. And I don't know that we can even imagine what hell is like. You know, people kind of throw hell around as a light word. Well, how was your day at work? Ah, oh, it was hell. Not even close. Not even close. Can you imagine a darkness and an isolation because again, it, hell is a place where nothing of God exists. There's no relationship. There's no joy. There's no anticipation. There's no hope. There's, there's, no, there's no love. There's none of this. It is just a place of darkness where you are left alone in your torment and the only voice you hear is your own broken cry. I can't imagine an eternity like that. But for people who want God to leave them alone in this life, God allows them to have an eternity like that. And it is not, not a place where we should ever wish anybody would go. You know, I say, well, man, that is really heavy stuff, Pastor. But Jesus talked about this, not to scare people into heaven, but to let them know the truth, that there's consequences to how people choose to live in this life. There's consequences Jesus came to set us free from this darkness, right? He came so that we don't have to experience the consequence of a life of sin. God came in human form to set us free and to deliver us. God wants everybody to enjoy eternal pleasures at his right hand. There is room in God's heaven for every person ever created. Do you believe that? There is, there is room and God created them with the hope that they would come to him. So today we have a choice. 
And most of you today, I know, and, and I know that, that you've made that choice to serve Jesus. I don't know everybody here. I don't know everybody out there on Facebook land. But if you're listening to this message and you're not a follower of Jesus, can I just tell you that this is God saying he loves you and he is warning you, please get on the path of life. Get off of that broad path, whatever you want to call it, and surrender your life to Jesus. Because he is truly the only way, the only truth, and the only source of life. There is a happily ever after, church. There's a happily ever after for every one of us who walks with Jesus, where there will be no pain, no problems, no sorrow, no tears, and we will slap backs and hug and high five, and Willard will say, Preacher, you didn't tell me it was going to be this good. I mean, it's better than you ever preached it. And I know it will be because we can't even imagine how good it is. But it's a choice, and it's on you. Now, somebody might say, well, preacher, that's all well and good. But what if you're wrong? What if you've totally blown it? What if this life is all there is? You've misled all these people. You've lived a lie yourself. Well, let's take a look at that. What if I am wrong? You know what? I've lived a life devoted to loving people. I've lived a life of faithfulness to my wife because that, that's a part of my Christian responsibility. I've told the truth. I've not been consumed by revenge. I've forgiven the people that hurt me, and I've moved on. I don't live in the past. I've lived a life where, where I have friends and I have family. I have connections with people. I, I'm, I'm valued as, a, as a, a person made in the image and likeness of God. And, and I've talked to, to somebody, if I'm wrong, I've talked to somebody who talked back to me <laughs> and, and loved me and blessed me. And, and I got to live a life of wonder, looking at every sunrise and sunset as a gift from God. And I laid my head down at night with a clear conscience. And I lived a life of peace and hope and joy. And then when it comes down to the end of my life, you know what? I'm going to lay down and I'm going to smile. And the name of Jesus is going to be, I pray, this is my prayer, seriously. You know, it, it's, it's Revelation 12, 11, or 11, 12. Um, <laughs> they overcame him. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And my prayer is, is that the last word on my lips is going to be the name of Jesus. So I'm going to have a smile on my face and the name of Jesus on my lips. And then I'm going to die. And you know what? If I'm wrong, I will never know it. But you, my friend, who question whether I'm right, if you're wrong, there is hell to pay. I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? It is pretty straightforward. What you do with Jesus matters. You know, there's a lot of take home for us on this church. I'm so glad we're on the right path. I am glad I'm on the right path. But I would consider it an absolute failure of my life if I ran my race and at the end of the day this baton was clutched in my hands in my casket. I made it. I didn't give this baton to anybody else, but I made it. Kind of quiet in here. It is not enough for us to know the path of life. It is our mission in life to take this runner's baton and to pass that on to somebody else who will pass it on to somebody else who will pass it on to somebody else. Our job is to be a witness to the truth. There is a path of life, brother, and I've known you for a while and you're not on it. But God loves you and he's got a way to bring you back if you'll accept it. We've got a mission, church, there is a path of life. It's real, I promise. But the happily ever after could be even hap more happily ever after, surrounded by people 
that we pass the baton to. People that know Jesus because our lives made a difference. You taught a Sunday school class. You got a chance to preach. You went to the nursing home. You went to the, to the jail. You talked to your friend in the break room. You invited that guy to church that you didn't really like, but you knew he needed Jesus, and Jesus could make him better. And you did it, and it worked. Everybody wants a happily ever after. And there is room in God's eternity for everybody to have a happily ever ever after. So the choice is up to us. Will we influence those who are on the wrong path? I pray that we don't lose sight of our vision. I was hoping for a better 2021. We've still got a lot of mess out there, but you know what? I think God can work all things together for good. People are thinking. Let's not lose sight of our mission, right? To be disciples who do what? Who make disciples? I'm still praying. I I haven't done as well. I'll be honest. I've not done well on on the mission myself. But I am praying, God, give me a fresh vision for the disciple that you want me to use. That you want to use me in their life. I hope that you're still praying about that. You're still thinking about that. It's so important. Eternity is at stake. So, Most important take home, if you're not a follower of Jesus, today you can be. Which path are you on? Are you on the path that leads to life? Or are you on a broad path still looking for a signal? I don't know which way to go. I I don't know. I don't have a compass. I don't know up from down. Spiritually, I'm lost. You don't know Jesus. Facebook friends, if you're out there listening, if you don't know Jesus, today is the day of salvation. Today you can get on the right path. The Bible says that that, uh, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. There is a way for you to get free, and his name is Jesus. Jesus died so that we could live. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. There may be somebody here today who is away from God, and you know you need to come home. God's been speaking to you, and you know, I need him. I need to recommit my life to him. Or maybe you've never been a Christian and you would like to become one. I want us to pray today. And and if you're not a Christian or you're away from God, could could I just ask you right now to, to lift a hand and say, you know what, I need Jesus. If that's you, I want Jesus. I want to get on the path of life. Is there anybody today that would lift a hand and say, you know, I'm not where I should be out there in Facebook. I need Jesus. I believe what you've said, Pastor Darren. I believe that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, and I want to get on the path that leads to life. Is there anybody out there? All right, I'm going to believe that there's somebody out there in Facebook watching later on YouTube that's going to say, you know what, I need that Jesus. Say, how do I do it? What do I do? Well, what we do is this. We say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I know I've I've violated your truth. I've been disobedient. I've done my own will. I've done things I shouldn't have done. I've overlooked things that, that should have been done. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. And Jesus, I ask that you would come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Jesus, forgive me of all my offenses and give me the gift of eternal life. And the Bible says it's that simple. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen? So Facebook friend, if you have not prayed that prayer, I would be glad to talk to you more about that. You can just leave me a note in the comments. Just say, contact me. I will do that. Uh, If you prayed this prayer with me out there in, in Facebook land, leave me a note. Just say, I prayed. Okay? Just that simple. I prayed. And uh, I will get in touch with you. Well, church, you know, another great verse in that Psalm 116 is when David says, As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones, in whom is all my delight. That's us. We are God's beloved sons and daughters. And it is a privilege to have a church family where we can experience God's love. And a fellowship meal like today is an opportunity to just kind of drink a little more deeply from that cup, and I hope that you will. 
Virginia Carter, it is so good to have you with us here this morning. We have missed you, and we're glad that you were here today. Um, I hope you'll stick around. We're going to enjoy a great meal together. I'm going to pray for our food and fellowship right now, and then we will move downstairs and enjoy. Father God, I thank you for this church family. God, I do not say that word family lightly. God, I have great delight as I have the privilege of preaching to them of telling them about the, the path and the glory that's involved, God. To, to think of the days when we're going to high-five and hug and, and celebrate together that we have received the, the inheritance, God, that you have promised us. Lord, we thank you for that day. But God, in the meantime, we have happy moments like today to enjoy some food and fellowship, to love on one another, to be a source of encouragement. God, we ask that you'd bless our food and our fellowship, our time together. May it be rich, Father. May we drink deeply at your cup. Father, thank you for this church family. I love them so much, God. And I just pray favor and grace upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Love you guys. Please come on down and join us. If you need special prayer, I'd be glad to pray.